Welcome everyone. Uh, Phyllis. Thank you. Good evening, <clears throat> Shalom. And uh, welcome to our program tonight with Hank Greenberg, a local Jewish community leader, giving us a firsthand look at events in Poland and Ukraine from his recent mission organized by the Jewish Federations of North America. My name is Phyllis Wang, and I am chairperson of the board of the Jewish Federation of Northeast New York. Before I go on, could I just ask us all to take a moment of silence in memory of those who were killed today, 14 young children at another, in another site in Texas, another school that was hit, so. Thank you. First, I want to thank our, lo <clears throat> our local Jewish Federation led by CEO Rob Kovach and his remarkable team for hosting this program. And second, I want to thank Caroline Seligman, chair of our North Country Havre Vatique, in response to requests from her group for encouraging us to arrange this program here in the North Country. And finally, to our sponsors, Havre Vatique, Skidmore Jewish Student Life, Chabad of Saratoga, Chabad of Clifton Park, Congregation Sheree Tefila and Temple Bethel, both from Glens Falls, and Temple Sinai for supporting us this evening. And to each of them, each in their own way, raising funds and awareness for the people of the Ukraine. After you hear the story tonight, I hope you'll consider supporting the emergency fundraising whether through Jewish Federation or through any of our North Country partner organizations, who have also undertaken efforts to assist in this growing humanitarian crisis. Hank Greenberg, back from a recent Federation-sponsored fly-in to the Ukrainian border, has graciously offered to talk with you this evening. He is a current shareholder at Greenberg Traurig. He has served as past president of the New York State Bar Association the largest voluntary state bar association in the nation, a former counsel to the New York State Attorney General, general counsel to a major New York State agency and federal prosecutor. Hank has handled numerous high profile matters. He concentrates his practice on civil litigation, criminal and civil investigations and regulatory and administrative law. Hank also carries an extensive lay leader background within the capital region Jewish community. He previously served on Jewish Federation's Board of Directors and Israel Affairs Committee. Additionally, he is a past president of Temple Israel. Hank, I will turn this over to you and thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. And uh, to all my dear friends at the Federation, my, my deepest gratitude for affording me this privilege and honor to speak with all of you this evening, uh, and share with you um, what I saw in the Ukraine and also try to give you an update of some of the issues I think that are impacting the world community, the Jewish community relative to the Ukraine. Um, uh, as Phyllis said, I've spent many years in the trenches of uh, courts and lawyers and litigation and uh, I'm 60 years old and I thought I saw a lot and had done a lot, uh, but nothing in my past life, professional life or otherwise prepared me for the experience of uh, just the sheer human toll and suffering that I saw um, in the time uh, that I was in um, uh, uh, Poland near the Ukrainian border. So it's only a month ago um, that I was uh, there um, and it was a whirlwind experience. I left on Sunday, April 3. I arrived on Monday, um, or rather Wednesday, April 6. I'll just give you a little bit of what the itinerary was so you get some sense of um, what I was experiencing firsthand. I, I left JFK at about four o'clock on a Sunday. Um, flew uh, to Zurich, Switzerland, from Zurich, Switzerland to Warsaw, Poland, 
from Warsaw, I took a charter flight uh, to an airport um, in the uh, um, eastern, southeastern region of Poland, where President Biden was just a few days earlier. And from there, I took a car about 60 miles to Medica, Poland. Uh, managed to do all of that, I think, from start to finish in about 16 hours. So it was exhausting, but it was well, it was well worth the experience. Worth it, um, less so from the personal experience, which was profound and meaningful, more so for the privilege of being able to share what I saw with all of you and with members of our community. Um, because it's important, I think, that we all bear witness to this tragedy, this nightmare, this humanitarian crisis, uh, but also what we do with that knowledge and information and what we can do here in the relative calm and safety and you know tranquil lives that we live, especially you in the North Country, it's one of my favorite regions of the state. Um, but there is much that we can do and I'll talk about that in, in just a moment. Um, when I took the drive, um, from first the flight and then the drive from the regional airport to Medica. Um, in a way, it was an extraordinary experience personally for me. Three of my four grandparents, uh, all four of my grandparents, Poland, Russian, Ukrainian, three of the four um, were immigrants who spoke uh, Yiddish as their first language um, and they were Polish. Uh, two of the four. And I was driving through towns that I had heard about, cities I had read and never expected. No, Greenberg had been there in over a hundred years. Leblin, sort of sign for Leblin. Um, and other towns of which I had heard about and read about just in terms of my own interest and experience uh, with Jewish history. Some of the towns were uh, names that I knew from my own sort of dive into World War II history. And, you know, one of the incredible things just about how the world can change in a lifetime um, was that if I would have told my grandparents, Russian, Poland, and Ukrainian, that the president of Ukraine was Jewish and that Poland, Poland uh, was the country in Europe that was most receptive to absorbing uh, refugees, my grandparents would have said, you're out of your mind, <laughs> right? Would never, 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 right? Think about that, Poland, Auschwitz, Treblinka, Baden-Baden, the guards of Ukraine. And to think in a lifetime, my lifetime, because I'm old enough to remember not just Holocaust survivors, but survivors who were relatively youthful, I'm 60, with their tattoos on their arm. And if they could have fathomed a time and a day, the leader of the Ukraine was Jewish, that the Ukraine, Ukrainian people had inspired the Western world, and that American Jewry, world Jewry, was reaching out and doing everything in its power to touch the lives of the Ukrainian immigrants, right? It's extraordinary, it is extraordinary. And I'll tell a little bit more about it, but what was really, I, if you ask me, amongst the most moving experiences is as the car is getting closer and closer to the border, uh, the driver who spoke no English in a thick Polish accent that I remember well from my grandparents, he's pointing to these hills and he's saying, Ukraine, Ukraine. And uh, it was Ukraine. I didn't go into Ukraine, uh, but I saw it and got close enough to it that you could taste it as I got cl near, clearer, closer and closer to the border. Medyka, uh, when I arrived midday, think about this. Medyka was a small, who ever heard of it? Town of 2,800 people um, on February 23rd. Uh, and today it is a bustling thousands of people, aid workers, humanitarian workers, refugees in this town. Um, it was transformed overnight. 
And what's sort of interesting today about how quickly the war is moving and developments are occurring with such rapidity, when I was there, um, now again, this is April 6th, 7th, and 8th, last month, uh, the war at that point was focused on Kyiv, right? The Russians at that point, this is relatively early in the war, when the Russians were seeking to decapitate the Ukrainian government. And ultimately, thank God, the Ukrainian military fought that back. And Southeast Poland was thought to be, well, it was a hub of refugees coming across the border. There were five or six medicas up and down the Polish border in which the refugees were streaming. Relatively safe. There was an incident of bombing in Lviv, which is about 60 miles to the east. One episode occurred relatively close in time to when the president was there. Undoubtedly, Russia did that to send some kind of signal or symbol. That was April. Today, the east is where the war has moved. Lviv has been bombed by Russian artillery on multiple occasions, right? So I was um, um, close to a war zone. Today, it is in a war zone, Medyka, and it happened all that quickly. Um, the war begins, as we know, February 24th. That's not that long ago, right? February 24th. We're in our third month. And during the first several weeks of the war, there were as many as a million refugees each week. Try to wrap your mind around that. A million refugees each week. In part, that's because the Ukrainian government and President Zelensky, as a strategy to um, um, be as safe as possible with the civilian pos population, don't think World War II, Battle of Britain, people running into the subways or bomb shelters. The Ukrainian strategy is get out of the country, women and children, and those not able to fight. That that is the best way to ensure their safety. And so today, just three months into the war, there are six and a half million, I'm gonna say it again, six and a half million refugees in three months. Poland has absorbed anywhere between two to three million uh, of those refugees, six and a half million. Just imagine that half of Manhattan in the space of three weeks has now moved to the North country, right? Into the Adirondacks. You can't process it. You can't imagine it. Six and a half million of a country with a population before the war, 41.1 million. That's 16% of the Ukrainian uh, population. Today, 12.8, let's round up, 13 million Ukrainians, 13 million out of a population of 41 million are displaced from their homes. So it's impossible really to try to visualize, to understand the devastation to the country, just in terms of the transference of the population out of the country or out of their homes. And of those refugees, virtually all of them are women and children, and those elderly who are able to sort of make the trek. And the Ukraine is a large country. So actually getting to the border is not a simple thing. And getting to the border now with the war moving down into the country is becoming more and more challenging and more and more dangerous. The UN estimates 4,000 civilian deaths. We don't have any reliable numbers at the moment in terms of the military, 258 of whom are children. And with all of this, the displacement out of homes, the refugees, civilian deaths, Ukrainian population death, what might be the most dangerous threat resulting from the war to the loss of life is Russia's insistence on blocking the coasts of the Ukraine. Keep in mind, the Ukraine is one reason why Putin wants it, right? One reason why Hitler wanted it, it is that it is the breadbasket of Europe. 
the amount of grain and agricultural produce. And as I drove through the countryside, it was really stunning. It was really stunning. It's flatter than certainly what you're experiencing in terms of you know, the Adirondacks by far, but it's just farmland, acre after acre after acre. And by blocking the coasts, that is denying the Ukrainians the ability to export its largest export, the grain and other agricultural products. And the United Nations believes the potential danger of famine and food shortages to Europe could cause more deaths than the war itself. So what you were watching on your television sets, your computer screens, your multiple devices, mobile devices, that I had the privilege of observing firsthand is a humanitarian crisis of staggering proportions. The world has not seen anything like this in 80 years, not since World War II. And if you believe some of the commentators, we are only seeing the early stages of the war playing out. Vladimir Putin and his megalomaniacal genocidal killing machine has in mind a long game strategy of squeezing the Ukrainian people, bringing that nation into rubble, causing as much despair as possible, and hoping that the world just sort of grows tired and bored of what's happening and moves to the next shiny object that the media would cover. That's the game plan. And these refugees that are leaving, think about this. When they are leaving, they're going to destinations unknown. There's no plan, there are no travel agents, right? They are leaving and only able to carry what they can carry on their pack or push on a cart. Sometimes all they have left is their will to survive. They have left behind their homes, their husbands, their fathers, their families, their friends, the life they once led. They don't know when they will return to Ukraine. Many of them don't know if they ever will. And three months ago, think about this, three months ago. And when I tell you the refugees that I saw, if you ask me, what do they look like? They look like us. They're not bedraggled, right? They're not impoverished. These are people who three months ago, on February 22nd, went to work, took vacations, enjoyed their families, lived normal lives, oblivious to the horrors fate had in store for them. When I was in Medica, I went to a refugee center um, and it was a shopping mall transformed into a clearinghouse for the refugees coming across, for them to be there, receive medical care and try to sort out where their next destination was. And there were spaces the size of high school um, um, basketball courts that had cot after cot after cot, a sea of cots that were filled with women, mothers, with their children running all around them with no privacy. Uh, and again, no idea where they were going. This was not also what I observed government in action in some systematic, uh, well-organized way. The best way I would describe it is organized chaos, but saying it's organized wouldn't be fair. The scope of the refugee crisis is so vast. The ability of even the Polish people at the border to sort of address these needs is overwhelmed by six and a half million people. So it's not like you see the United Nations at the border. It's not like you see the Red Cross at the border. Think about this. Before this war, it's not as though we're in the second or third or fourth year of the World War II when the Red Cross or any world war, or any large conflagration where the Red Cross has the ability to build up armies of people to address the needs of the suffering. The total number of people employed by the Red Cross at one time are tens of thousands scattered across the world. So they're not there able to care, give care packages. So what did I see? What I saw were people all across the globe, many of them, most of them, people who before the war were not professional aid workers, social workers. These are people who were in a place in their life 
both in terms of either work or family or physical capacity and health. To just get in a plane and get to the border, not knowing what they would do there and taking one of those cots that I saw and doing everything they could. And what was, I have to say to all of you and to our Jewish community, one of the unbelievably stunning things, I can't say I was ever prouder, is I'm walking across the area, right, in this border area, and, and, and I don't see signage of recognizable relief workers. The only signage I see are of Jewish groups. Unbelievable, right? JNF, Hadassah, uh, uh, the joint, the uh, fla Israeli flag everywhere. It was, believe me, I didn't even begin to expect anything remotely like that. At that time, there were 4 million refugees, and at most, right, an estimate I heard was between 10 to 15,000 of them were Jewish. There are Jews in Warsaw, Poland, in any significant numbers. The Jewish community, let's take Warsaw, which is a population today of about a million and a half. During World War II, it was a population of 1.4 million, 1.2 million, 400,000 of them were Jews, all wiped out. Only a couple hundred survivors in Warsaw, Poland. Placed in the Warsaw ghetto and exterminated by the Nazis. So... There are not, even in Warsaw, Poland, where I spent a couple of days, not a lot of Jews, not a lot of Jews in Ukraine. There are communities, but I'm sort of making this point to say the number of Jews that are crossing uh, from the Ukraine as refugees are relatively small in number, and yet world Jewry, American Jewry, Israel is there in force. You can't miss it. At the refugee center, all of the medical assistance all of it was provided by doctors and nurses flown in from Hadassah. And I asked this one physician, a pediatrician, I asked her, I said, are you seeing a lot of people suffering from trauma, PTSD? And her answer to me was yes, but without the P, not post-traumatic stress disorder. The stress and the trauma was too fresh. Thankfully, these victims of Putin's war machine the refugees are safe, but when you look at them, you see the loss and pain on their face. These are people who have not only lost their lives, many of them that I met have lost their husbands, fathers, boyfriends. They have seen Russian soldiers commit war crimes against innocent civilians. They have lost the only world they know, the nation they love. And like all of us now, the refugees watch from a safe, relatively safe distance as their nation is reduced to rubble. The barbarity and the sadism is blood chilling. The Russian army now thinks it's a form of warfare to launch artillery strikes against maternity wards, hospitals, Red Cross centers. They target civilian populations. They fire live rounds of ammunition at a nuclear a reactor site. They've laid waste to the cities of Kiev. I'm sure all of you have seen on the news Mariupol and the brave, brave Ukrainian soldiers that held out almost to the last man in Mariupol. I'm sure you saw the pictures from Buka, a suburb of Kiev. Human rights agencies went in and saw bodies of civilians strewn along the streets, people with hands tied behind their back, executed by bullets to their head, mass graves with 300 bodies in them. And we will learn of more atrocities. We don't even begin to have any idea other than our imagination and common sense about the scope of the human crisis and war crimes committed in Mariupol. But all of us on this call, this is not, these horrors are not something we are not familiar with. We have been here before. The Jewish people have been here before. Indeed, 80 years ago, once again, in the center of Europe, the center of the civilized world, we watch a megalomaniacal dictator slaughter the innocent. We watch 
a madman, an autocrat with a military that follows his will, inflict unbelievable suffering. But rest assured, the Ukrainians are going to prevail. And they are prevailing. They are winning. They tossed the Russians out of the north in Kiev. Russian morale, by all reports, is falling to pieces. Between 10 to 15 Russian generals have died. We are seeing now, for the first time, really in the modern history of Russia, journalists, diplomats, resigning in protest because what they see. Yes, the Ukrainians will win, and they will win because they have to win. They have to win because they're fighting for their freedom, their land, their way of life. But we need them to win. The world needs them to win. We cannot, we must not, we're not going to allow the sacrifice and bravery and courage of the Ukrainian soldiers be in vain. The civilized world, if it is going to remain civilized, must defend democracy against autocracy. We cannot allow the rule of law to devolve to the law of tooth and claw. And it is not. The world community, like the American people, like the Jewish community in America and across the world, stands as one together in their support for Ukraine. The volunteers I mentioned, all that I could see was Jaffe, JFNA, JDC, Hadassah, Israeli flags at the border. And the same was true in Warsaw. Remember, Warsaw. Warsaw, where the streets, there's blood-soaked streets in Warsaw for the Jewish people. And in Warsaw, a city of 1.6 million, grandpa and grandma, do you hear me? They've absorbed 3 million refugees for humanitarian purposes. I went to a hotel in Warsaw, Poland, a city I never wanted to go to. It wasn't, wasn't in my bucket list. There was nothing about Warsaw that I ever wanted to see. And I went to a hotel where the JDC rents out rooms in the hotel, 50 hotel rooms where they are taking Jewish refugees and those who want to make Aliyah to Israel, facilitating that, and taking any other refugees without regard to their religion. I attended one meeting in this hotel. We sat in a circle, and there were these teenage young women uh, who had seen enough in just the last few weeks. They might have been 16 or 17 or 18. They obviously were older now. But to see them sitting in the circle and telling stories with little children running around the rooms, but these women telling stories about their boyfriends in the military who they can't make contact with. Are they alive? Are they dead? When will they see them next? So why is there this outpouring of support, particularly from our community? Why our community? with our complicated relationship and history with Poland, with the Ukraine, and with Russia. Why? Because the Jewish people understand that where there is suffering anywhere, all people are impacted by it. We understand, like no other people, what it means when you say war crimes, crimes against humanity, we understand because we've lived it. Those of us my age, or even those of us younger who remember the generation of the World War II veterans, we understand the threat to humanity, to the threat to the Jewish people and the world if this kind of violence and heartbreak and terror is appeased. Responding to this kind of loss of life, these war crimes, the crimes against humanity, it is who we are. It is in our DNA. It is what we do. 
sadly, tragically, undeniably, the Jewish people have a more acute understanding of how an otherwise sophisticated nation like Russia can be turned into a killing machine at the command of a dictator. We understand it from the pharaohs to the inquisition to the pogroms of the Russian empire, the Holocaust, it has taught us well. Never again is not a mere slogan. It is a mantra born of a millennia of suffering. And all of us on this call, we all know that a central tenet of, of our faith, tikkun olam, to heal the world, tzedakah, righteousness. The Talmud teaches that whoever saves one life saves us all. So we can, so we will. All of us are doing our part and will do our part in this battle of yes, good against evil. And we can do that by helping the Ukrainian refugees. Indeed, all of us in this room, all of us watching in this virtual room are performing a mitzvah. All of you are. You're performing a righteous deed. You are performing one of the most important commandments of the Jewish people, given the suffering of our people through the millennia. You were bearing witness to the suffering of fellow human beings. And bearing witness is more than just seeing, it is a moral responsibility. And you are fulfilling that responsibility. But we need to do more. Few of us can drop everything like the volunteers I saw at the border and in Warsaw. But we can all contribute to help the refugees. Their needs are unbelievably urgent. And there are so many. The six and a half million refugees streaming against the border. They need food. They need shelter. They need clothing. They need medical supplies. They need safe passage. They need safe haven. The refugees are in dire need of your aid. Think of the homebound elderly, many of whom live with disabilities. They can't survive without humanitarian supplies, medicines, and regular contact with caregivers. The Federation has never, in my experience, all the blessed, extraordinary, unbelievable things it has done. But the urgency with which the leadership, Phyllis, Rob, Amy, Shelley, who's on the call, and others have just in this moment, in this crisis, responded with an alacrity and a passion that is nothing short of inspiring. JNFA across the globe, or rather the United States, has raised $60 million. The Federation has raised $200,000. That's so impressive. It's extraordinary. But it is a drop in the bucket for the overall need. And the crisis has just begun. So your help is crucial. Anything you can give, whatever you can afford, will make a difference. Obviously, through your gift to Jewish Federation or a designated gift, your impact will be deep. It will be meaningful. Please do your part. It is who we are. We pay homage and respect and honor the legacy of those who came before us by responding to this humanitarian crisis, by responding to the very place where the most horrific, most devastating, most extraordinary carnage of Jewish people took place. We cannot let it happen again. To all of you for bearing witness in everything you do and being on this call and listening to me, I thank you for the efforts you have made, and I hope and pray you will make going forward. Yasha Kala. Thank you. Thank you, Hank. We appreciate you taking the time to be with us tonight and for your very inspiring remarks. Um, I'll open it up for a few minutes for questions. Um, if you raise your virtual hand or your real hand, I'll try to uh, call on you. Um, or put a question in the chat. Hank, if you uh, let me just ask you a question. Um, oh, I, Barry, I, Barry Finley. Yes, um, I'm an artist, and I would like to say that I had painted three pictures about this Holocaust, uh, and I did not realize I was uh, fulfilling or carrying out my part in ancient Jewish tradition, but I think the anger and uh, sadness I felt was 
probably part of my heritage. I just want to mention that they're on display at the Saratoga Senior Center on the back wall, three pictures about the Ukrainian tragedy. Uh, thank That's you. beautiful. Thank you, Barry. All right, uh, um, Hank, have you had an opportunity to speak to others who have been there um, on more, uh, even more recent trips? Uh, not in the last couple of weeks, but I am in, what's really dazzling, I will tell you this, Phyllis, is uh, uh, um, the, particularly amongst Jews that I'm encountering, is this instinct, this reflex. Uh, what can I do? How can I do it? How can I help? Um, Amy and Rob and I, for example, were on the phone just the other day um, with two people in, in, in the city who uh, are Jewish, but I, 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 I wouldn't tell you that they have any great connection to um, uh, Jewish institutions or organizations um, and are inspired to do something and come um, 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 uh, I, I will tell you this, and, and we've seen this, and I know Amy and Rob have seen this, people who uh, previously, sort of their relationship to Judaism and Jewish history, by virtue of their involvement even with this, have engaged in a way that's palpable, right? It's, um, it's really something to say. Um, stunning and surprising and, and wonderful and inspiring. Thank you. Yeah. Uh um, Barry, you wanted to say something else? Well, I guess righteous anger is also part of the Jewish heritage, especially <laughs> since the birth of the state of Israel. And my sense of justice impels me to, to point out that the United States is implicated in this tragedy uh, because they took off, they disarmed their nuclear weapons in 1994, most of which were pointed at the United States in return for a promise of protection from the United States and the UK. And yet, of course, to avoid antagonizing Russia, the United States has avoided providing with the weapons they were, might have used to beat back that Russian invasion from the beginning. And, and that's part of my feeling that I printed these pictures too. Uh, Barry, let me make this observation because I was on a, um, I did an interview the, the other day and um, uh, I was sort of asked about how, how this war came to be. Right. How did we sort of sleepwalk into this as a world? Um, and I said two things that I believe both in with equal sort of ferocity. One is the institutions that are supposed to prevent war from happening failed. They failed. Right. In the center of Europe, we are now seeing a war and a humanitarian crisis that we haven't seen in 80 years. That's true. On the other hand, um, uh, it is one of the most exciting developments I've seen to see America assert its leadership in the world community again. We are again leading the free world right now. Make no mistake. In response to this crisis, right, we have uh, reunited the NATO allies. NATO is expanding. Who would have ever thought that? Um, Russia is... Um, seriously wounded by this. Putin, for the rest of his life, will be a pariah. I mean, one thing I'm reasonably certain of, however this war ultimately gets resolved, God willing, quickly, but when the smoke clears and the bloodshed ends, uh, Putin and the generals, his generals, are going to be held accountable for these war crimes. I, right? My, I tell you this, he will not be safe to leave any other country other than Russia and China, unless he wants handcuffs placed on him. Well, my only, my only hope is that the result of this war will be a change in the view of other countries that are so inclined toward war, because they will see that it has not worked. But I'm afraid that by the time the Ukrainian army pushes back the Russian army, and they are winning that war militarily, there may not be enough Ukrainians left for a nation. Uh, Emmanuel Kutar, one of the guys who had a bad yeah, yeah. questioned him on using the word genocide. And generally, I would agree that it has been widely used and more and more with less in rele relevance to what happened you know, to Jews in, in World War II. But I do believe that this is a genocide. It's an attempt to eliminate the Ukrainian nation as a nation. And I'm really frightened that he will succeed at this, no matter 
what the cost, and no matter what the price. This war could go on for a very long time, I'm afraid. That's my fear. Kelly, did you want to say something? Um, the only thing I wanted to say was that I was honored that the uh, Capital District Council for the Social Studies joined the Jewish Federation's fundraising effort, putting into their newsletter um, all the information about our rally and then following it up with more uh, requests for donations. So I think there's a um, interfaith and uh, effort to join the Jewish community to assist Ukraine as best we can. And I'm grateful for that. Thanks for all you do, Hank. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you, guys. It's, uh, you know, it's everybody should be unbelievably proud that, well, the whole world, right? Turn on the DV every day, Ukraine, 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 Ukraine. And everybody wants to help. And we have, the Federation has filled that vacuum. Nobody knows how to help. Federation alone, as a practical matter, has been out front, visible, public, raising funds and helping people to figure out how they can be with assistance. Um, and I did, I, I saw one question in the, in the chat box and, and I'll sort of respond to it. Someone sort of said, is there a concern that the world will grow weary uh, of this, turn to something else um, and thereby sort of allow uh, Putin to gain the offensive? I think that is at this moment, that is the greatest threat. Mm -hmm. To the Ukrainian people because like I said I think most objective military advisors uh, uh, are, are very optimistic about the Ukrainians chances um, in the near term but of course their chances are a function of uh, the largesse of the world in terms of military aid and support and assistance I know some people would like to see more would like to see new NATO with boots on the ground and all of that but nevertheless the Ukrainians would not be fighting this war and at the moment getting the better of this war without the extraordinary support of the West. And I'm very, I mean, I'm very, very hopeful that that will continue. And I'm very, very hopeful for this reason. Uh, uh, clearly the NATO allies understand, right? They've learned this lesson of history. For all we can be despairing and pessimistic about, they know you cannot appease a dictator in the center of Europe. They know that, lesson learned. Right, um, lesson learned, and they're showing that. So that's really encouraging. Thank you. Um, it's, I have time for one final question if anyone has something they'd like to ask. Okay. One more. The United Nations, did you see them there? I keep wondering where the United Nations is. Yeah, uh, I, Shelley, that's a, uh, I speak from obviously myself, very, very troubling. They've got a huge problem among others. Here's the biggest problem that they have. Uh, uh, the Security Council of the UN, um, um, which can veto any action by the UN, includes a seat at the table for Russia. Uh, they should have lost that table when the Soviet Union broke up, you know, outside of the, uh, their stockpiling of nuclear weapons. Uh, they don't belong there, just the size of their economy uh, or their influence in the world, but yet that's what the UN is dealing with. So, uh, you know, this, this, I, I think this is, you know, the UN has shown, you know, obviously uh, a great capacity and ability to sort of deploy peace workers and, you know, deal with social services and issues like that. but. This is a catastrophic failure for the UN, this war, the very fact that there is this war, mm -hmm. right? Thank you very much, Hank. Um, for of those of you who may be interested in uh, making a donation uh, to the humanitarian um, funds, um, there is in the chat a link to do that. And I'll leave this up for a few moments or you may um, be interested in donating through other Jewish organizations, whatever your connection is to, just, um, it's a mitzvah. I hope you will consider it. Thank, 
Thank you so very much for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. Bye, everyone.